Hello everyone, thank you for joining my channel once again. Today we are going to be looking at uh, a game in the Von Henning Shara Gambit uh, from uh, Vikenze uh, 2022 uh, with the white pieces. You have American Grandmaster Sam Shanklin and with the black pieces, uh, world champion Magnus Carlson. And the other photo you see there in the picture is actually uh, a picture of uh, one of the namesakes of the Gambit, uh, Heinrich Georg Julius von Henning, uh, who was a German uh, naval officer. Uh, and he was a strong player to boot uh, in the um, 1930s. And uh, he popularized the Gambit after winning a game against a, a player named Jacobson in 1929. Uh, uh, he fought in World War I. Uh, he was actually a naval, a German naval officer who made it all the way to the rank of rear admiral. And he lived from 1883 uh, to 1947. So that is where the uh, Hennig, uh uh, Von Henning uh, side of the Gambit comes from. Uh, he had an interesting uh, life. Um, he was uh, captured. He was a prisoner of war. He was captured uh, by the Welsh. And he actually escaped and then was recaptured. Um, I guess his comrades that were supposed to pick him up uh, by boat, um, his view, his vision was obscured by a, a rock protruding out of. Uh, some water as I read and he couldn't see them and uh, he wind up being recaptured again and uh, but he wind up uh, living uh, through the war and he was a naval officer and like I said he made it all the way up to the rank of rear uh, rear admiral and with all of that going on he was a very uh, strong chess player at the time and uh the second player, uh, Shara, is an Austrian chess player, Anton uh, Anton Shara, who um, popularized uh, the gambit when he defeated a strong player, uh, Ernst Grunfeld, in 1929. Uh, so... Um, before I get into this game with uh, Sam Shanklin and Magnus Carlsen, I just want to show you a another famous game really quick um, by Alexander Alakon. Uh, the game is Pirk Alakon, um, 1931. And this is the game that I use to introduce everybody to the uh, to this gambit. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful game. And it just shows you what it looks like when everything goes right uh, for black. Okay, so this game took place in Bled, 1931. So D4 from Pyrrhic, D5, C4, E6. For those of you who don't don't know, Pyrrhic is a uh, He's the uh, inventor or the popularizer of the Pyrrhic defense. Knight C3 and now C5. So this is where the uh, the uh, uh, Von Henning uh, Shara Gambit uh, derives uh, from the uh, Tarish uh, defense. Where white usually plays C takes D5. And black would normally play this move E takes uh, D5. Five going to isolated pawn positions in the Tarish uh, defense. Right, there's a lot of theory there. However, these players had this idea to play C takes D4, drawing the queen out. Queen A4, check. Another move is Queen uh, D5. Uh, excuse me, Queen uh, D4 right away. We're not going to get into all of the theory and variations. Bishop D7, <clears throat> and now. Queen, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Queen takes D4. All right, now so far we're actually following the same moves in the uh, Shanklin uh, Carlson game. E takes D5, Queen takes D5, 
and now you can see that the pawn on b7 is on prees knight c6 and bishop g5 is played here by pyrrhic um he might be planning the castle queen side and he wants to get his bishop uh outside of the pawn chain and in an aggressive manner all right also since black is down the pawn black must play very actively and it is in black's favor to be able to exchange um black's potentially uh, active pieces in another game that alakon played actually is white uh, he played the move a knight f3 which is a reasonable plan all right and his idea was to keep the dark square bishop inside the pawn chain so for instance moves like uh, e3 and bishop d2 at some point so for instance with alakon having the white pieces he played this move queen d1 here all right so after e takes d5 queen takes d5 um in this game which is uh, alexander alakon with the white pieces against uh doing the simul uh the black player played knight f6 immediately all right gambiting the pawn on b7 alakon played queen d1 knight c6 knight f3 here bishop b4 e3 queen b6 bishop e2 castles castles rook fd8 and bishop d2 and you can see how the bishop on d2 uh is even though it's passive it serves as like a temporary shield down the d file remember black is up a pawn so he's just excuse me white is up a pawn so he's just playing to consolidate gradually trade off pieces build an impregnable position and the onus is on black to show that he has compensation for this pawn and of course, being a simul, Alakon went on to neutralize any initiative that Black had built up. And he went on to win this game in uh, 35 moves. So back to our game real quick between Pyrrhic and Alakon. Bishop d7, queen takes d4, e takes d4, queen takes d5. So instead of knight f6 here, Pyrrhic. I'm sorry, Alakon just played knight c6 right away. And bishop g5 was played. And like I said, knight f3 is playable and um, with with this uh, idea that I mentioned uh, earlier. Knight f6. And now queen d2. Alakon played h6. And now bishop takes f6 is played. Queen takes f6. And we can see black getting more and more active now that the bishop has been developed by white right at the cost of a tepi black is ready to castle uh queen side however white is trying to play this slow consolidation game he plays his move e3 which is very very slow um he has to get the bishop out that's understood but at this point maybe knight d5 is better going into trying to uh uh, counterattack uh, uh, cause some more trades in the position all right maybe queen d6 for example e4 and knight b4 from black this is like a, a equal position e3 castles castle so this is uh pyrrhic's idea he got the bishop out of the pawn chain traded off another piece castles castle but now the problem is this um you know opposition of the queen and the rook on the d file so alakon immediately is tactically alert as he is plays bishop g4 hitting the rook the queen is hit on uh, uh d2 knight d5 right a little too late for that he should have probably did that before alakon plays rook takes d5 queen takes d5 <clears throat> and now a beautiful move developing a piece with the threat of mate you can't beat that all right bishop a3 and you can see b2 is uh threatened and the rook is still threatened on d1 queen b3 from pick if he takes here b takes a3 then just queen a1 king c2 bishop d1 check 
Queen takes D1 and Queen takes A2 check and then the A3 pawn is going to fall also and white is just lost. Okay, Bishop A3, so Queen B3, Bishop takes D1, Queen takes A3. Again, King D1 is out of the question because just simply Queen takes F2. You can see the Bishop on F1 is on, uh, on priest. If Bishop D3, just Queen takes G2. Knight f3, rook d8, etc., etc., and black is just steamrolling white here with these tactics. And your game is over. So, bishop takes uh, d1, queen takes a3, and there it is again. Queen takes f2, and notice Alakon just keeps going with the initiative. Queen d3. And Bishop G4. The threat here for uh, Black is to play the move uh, Queen E1, resulting in Queen E1 check, resulting in um, uh, winning White's Queen here. So, for example, I'll give Black another move. If Black could play Queen E1 here, check, it drives the King up to C2, and now you can see the fork Knight B4, and that's the threat um, with Bishop G4. So. Pyrrhic plays knight f3 to block the uh, threat on e1. All right, so now e1 threat is the e1 threat is gone. So what does Alakon do? He removes the defender. <laughs> Bishop takes f3, and now queen f5 check. King b8, and now queen takes f3. Queen e1, king to c2, and of course there's no um, uh, fork here. Alakine just plays rook c8 with his last uh, piece. And now queen g3 uh, from pick. And this is what pick is counting on. The force of uh, the force trade of queens. But Alakine have seen a little further and just plays the move 95. Discover check. And so there will be no queens traded. And then after king b3. Queen d1 check. King a3. Rook c5. And uh, uh, Pirk resigned because there's no, no real way to stop uh, the idea of Rook A5 without losing tons of material and getting made it anyway. So that is a beautiful STEM game in the uh, uh, Von Henning uh, Shara Gambit that I always uh, like to show uh, people. So now that you've seen what it looks like for black and what black is trying to get in the position let's go to our game between these two um, high level grandmasters okay so stepping back out of the time machine back in uh, 2022 now here's the game Sam Shanklin Magnus Carlson so same position Tarish C takes D5 and C takes D4. Queen A4 check. Bishop D7. Queen takes D4. E takes. Queen takes D5. And Knight F6 from Magnus Carlsen. So Magnus Carlsen plays in the same way as those amateurs did uh, in that Simul versus um, Alakon. All right. Where instead of playing Knight C6, playing Knight F6 first. Tempting and baiting white into grabbing the B7 bond. Which gives uh, black uh, probably too much compensation for the pawn. So queen b3. And here's a slight deviation, right? Because we saw the idea of queen d1. Queen d1 is also possible. But here Sam plays the move queen um, uh, b3 here. This has its pros and cons. Yes, the queen is more uh, active and also is not blocking the uh, king if the king uh, wants to castle uh, kingside or blocking the rook if the rook wants to come to d1. So time is being saved there. However, with the queen exposed uh, so early, uh, is white really saving time because eventually that queen is going to be susceptible to attacks from black, whether it's from the bishop. Going to e6, for example, uh, knight coming to um, c6 and then d4 or c6 to a5 or something, uh, you know, along those lines where the queen can be bounced around. So 
there's uh, pros and cons to both moves, uh, queen d1 and queen b3. So knight a6 by Carlson, slightly unusual, but it's a clear idea. And that again, um, going back to the theme of exploiting the early um, uh, queen sortie, uh, the queen is exposed. So you can play a move like knight a6 because you're going to get the tempi right back and come to a nice uh, a square. Right, which gives your piece attacking chances. So your knight will be on a fourth rank as opposed to the third. Knight f3, knight c5 hitting the queen, and now the queen goes back to c2 and rook c8. So already you can see the build up, the attack uh, is coming from black. All right, remember the onus is on black to justify the pawn sacrifice. So rook c8, and you can see these ideas with e4. Queen is in an uncomfortable position. E3. So um, here, Shanklin does not try to get the bishop out. Some type of active square like F4, G5. Right? He realizes he has to just consolidate at this point. Hunker down. And it, like I said, it's the same idea Alakon used in 1932. With knight, knight F3, bishop D2, bishop E2, castles. And say, hey, I have a super solid position. I'm just going to develop and you have to justify your sacrifice. Knight c4, bishop d3, knight takes c3, b takes c3. So black hasn't won the pawn back yet, but he has a significant weakness that he has created on c3. Knight d5, attacking the pawn, castles, and Shanklin um, re just returns the pawn. Bishop b2, bishop b4. And now bishop takes c3, bishop takes c3, and rook a b1. So we see the b pawn is being attacked again, but bishop f6 hitting the queen again. Queen e2, and now just rook c7. Of course, this idea right here is just to advance this pawn uh, e4, e5. And this is exactly what happens. Bishop e7. All right. So... The pawns are equal. White has more space in the center. And now the position looks more like a, uh, you know, quote unquote, normal position. Um, but black has compensation. He has a bishop here. All right. And um, I like his two to one uh, queen side uh, majority here. Knight d4. Bishop c5 here. And now e6. And just like that. We can see that Sam Shanklin is now up a pawn again. And he has, a, he has a, a good position. We can't say that black is really more active than white at this point. Right? Too much more active. King h8. Queen h3. Threatening, threatening mate. And one against Magnus Carlsen. That would be excellent for uh, white. h6. So this is good for Shanklin. He creates a substantial. Uh, uh, provokes black into creating a substantial weakness. On um, on the king side there on g6. Goodness gracious. It's queen g3. Again, just a simple, simple idea. Right? Nothing grandmasterly about that. Right? You don't need the book Think Like a Grandmaster to, to figure that out. Queen g6 and queen h7 mate. Rook d7. So, of course, this is uh, going to... Going to uh, Put a stop to that idea because of queen g6. Just simply rook takes d3. Rook b3 protecting. And saying, hey, I'm going to force my idea. So Magnus just simply plays rook f6. So now there will be no queen g6. h3 happens. b6. Putting the pawns on a dark square. And here's another thing too that occurs in this opening quite a bit. Is you do get these opposite color bishops at the end. Which definitely leads to these drawish uh, endings. So although white was up a pawn. The final result was a draw after the move bishop c2. Um, by Shanklin here. Because after rook takes d1. There's no way that black is going to lose this game. Except that he just gives his bishop away. Because the opposite color bishop endings notoriously drawn. And um if you look at the, 
I'll go back to it real quick. Um, the the Alakine uh, game against the Amateurs, um, you had the same ending, except the Amateurs lost, of course. I'll show you that ending just real quickly. So in this ending, I just wanted to point out the opposite color bishops. And this is the, a game uh, where Alakine had the white pieces playing against the uh, Von Henning Shara against uh, <clears throat> uh, am uh, amateur players with the black pieces. And uh, actually in this position is black to move. Black played to move bishop d6 um, in order to protect his, his back rank. He probably should have just played rook e8, but he's lost in this position, by the way. But the reason why he's lost is not necessarily because the opposite... Um, uh, uh, because of opposite color bishops, he's lost because of the rooks, the positions of the rooks on the board. If you took the rooks off, uh, black would uh, uh, probably uh, draw uh, draw this game. All right. Even, uh, you know, it's a, instead of being uh, four to three, it's uh, five, uh, five pawns to uh, uh, six pawns to uh, five rather. But it's the rooks staying on the board uh, that makes this position actually lost for black. Um but in contrast to the position with uh, Magnus in um, in Shanklin, there's no um, the the rooks. First of all, the rooks are being traded, but the um, uh, neither side has um, oh, like a super active rook. So Shanklin doesn't have a rook where he could dominate the the position and start creating threats and things like that. So if you are in positions with uh, if you are in positions with uh, opposite color bishops. Um, Try to keep the try to keep a, a pair of rooks on the board. Uh, not a pair of rooks, but, but try to keep uh, one of the rooks on the board, right? If you try, if you're the winning side, if you're the stronger side, that'll give you uh, definite uh, winning chances, especially if you're up a pawn. And back to the Shanklin uh, Carlson game, as you can see, the contrast of the position. See how the rooks. See how Shanklin's rook is not dominating the position. In fact, it's in a very um, defensive position as it has to guard the bishop on um, on d3. So if the bishop moves anywhere, the rooks the rooks get traded off immediately. And of course, the rook can't move because um, you know the bishop would get would get uh, snatched off, right? So the only thing that um, Shanklin could possibly try to do is maybe play moves like to try to, to win. Let's play like King F1, King E2, protect the bishop, move the rook. And that to me seems, um, you know, like protracted and, and convoluted as white, it's, uh, black would definitely create counter chances um, with his rook, um, you know, even just by checking on the E file for, uh, for example. So. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that game. Um, please get in the comments below. Let me know what you think about it. And also, uh, remember, Chess Audiobooks is on LeeChess, Chess.com, Instagram, Twitter. So follow me on those platforms. And um, please hit the thumbs up and check the links below. Uh, and please consider uh, supporting my channel. And I'll see you guys on the next video.